Welcome to History at the OK Corral. History too real for the Westerns. Don't forget to click like, share, subscribe, ring that notification bell, and leave us a comment if you like this story. The source for tonight's episode is The Journey of Crazy Horse by Joseph M. Marshall III. Link to purchase is in the description below. June 25th, 1876, early afternoon, in what is today's southern Montana. On the banks of what is known to them as the Greasy Grass River, a large camp of Lakota and Cheyenne milled about their village, ensconced in their daily routine of chores and recreation. Many of the young warriors were just now waking up, exhausted after a long night of ribald celebration and dancing. Children swam in the river, women tended campfires, and young men tended to the large horse herds that belonged to the camp. This was, in fact, the largest encampment of Plains tribes that would ever be recorded. The Lakota and Cheyenne had come together during this blistering Plains summer with the intent of luring the U.S. Army's cavalry forces into an ambush. The U.S. Army was responsible for enforcing the policies decided upon by the U.S. government, regardless of whether those policies were consistent with treaties signed and promises made to native tribes from Florida to the Pacific Northwest. The U.S. Army's cavalry were the most commonly encountered by the Plains tribes as they were the only forces capable of locating, pursuing, and engaging horseback warriors on the vast expanse of the open plains. The Blue Coats, as they were colloquially known amongst the Plains tribes, had inflicted not only costly defeats, but committed a number of what could only be termed as massacres amongst many tribes, including the Lakota and the Cheyenne. But they had also been on the receiving end of horrific violence that had at times rivaled or surpassed the ferocity that many of these soldiers had experienced during the Civil War. They were commanded by men who had cut their teeth in some of the Civil War's most ferocious battles. Men like Captain Frederick Benteen, Major Marcus Reno, and General George Armstrong Custer. Most of the men, though, were relative neophytes to Plains warfare, and many of them were relatively recent immigrants who now found themselves fighting for their lives in austere outposts against an enemy who often appeared out of nowhere, killed with an extreme prejudice, mutilated the dead in horribly macabre ways, and disappeared just as quickly. The army had been sweeping the northern plains for years, attempting to bring the plains tribes to bear. But they had struggled for decades as fighting such a decentralized enemy posed problems that the officers trained in classic Napoleonic warfare struggled to address successfully. On this day, though, the large encampment of Lakota and Cheyenne felt there was little to no chance of running into the Bluecoats. They assumed their enemy was near, but most of the war chiefs had agreed it would be days yet before their marshaled forces would have an opportunity to be brought to bear against their incessant harassers. In this expansive two-mile encampment, home to anywhere from six to 10,000 Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho, most of the inhabitants felt safe, at ease, and perfectly content to enjoy the day. But one among them sat pensively in his lodge. He had a bad feeling. He had hardly slept the night before, as he had been convinced that a morning attack from the cavalry was imminent. The light of dawn had proven his prophecy not wholly correct, but he still had a feeling that something was not right, that the Bluecoats were not, in fact, that far away at all. He had grown up the product of an interband relationship, his father being an Oglala and his mother being from the Minikonju band. He had been known as Curly as a boy. That was his name when, at the age of 14, he went on a vision quest into the Black Hills of the Dakotas. For three days and nights he fasted, until a spirit appeared to him in a vision. He was told that his life from that point forward must be dedicated to the welfare of his people. He was told that he would be a great warrior and that no bullet nor arrow would kill him. He was also told that he would die a martyr's death at the hands of the Bluecoats. He returned to his village and embarked on his career as a vaunted warrior. That, though, had been many years ago. Though he was now married, his face was scarred from the bullet that had torn into it years earlier when the jealous husband of Black Buffalo Woman had discovered them after they had eloped from the village. 
She was the true love of his life, and though they had been forced apart, the scar was a constant reminder of a love lost. In the interim between this summer day in 1876 and his vision quest some two decades earlier, the young warrior had built himself into a venerable fighter, and then into a trusted leader. Though his personal indiscretions with married women had cost him the title of chief, this seemed a matter of mere formality. He was a war chief, and his name inspired awe in his compatriots and terror in his enemies. He was the veritable puzzle wrapped in an enigma, wrapped in a riddle. He was known to his people as Tishanka Witko, but history knows him as Crazy Horse. And while Crazy Horse's prediction would prove to be slightly askew in terms of timing, his intuition about a large battle coming that day would prove correct. Today, he and his Plains Warrior cohorts would take part in the largest battle in Plains Warfare history, and they would all but annihilate their hated enemies, the Bluecoats. However, as momentous as the occasion would prove to be, it started with some of the village spotted a dust cloud. This was the result of the 7th Cavalry's engagement with a Lakota camp down the river. During this engagement, two cavalrymen had their mounts spooked so badly by the gunfire, bugle calls, and screams that they bolted from the battlefield, their hapless riders captive to their fight or flight instincts. Unfortunately for these men, their horses bolted straight for Crazy Horse's encampment. They were met by startled Lakota, whose initial disbelief gave way to rage soaked in dignity. The two soldiers were quickly yanked off their mounts and promptly clubbed and stabbed to death as they pled for mercy. Word soon reached Crazy Horse that the cavalry was attacking. Seemingly unsurprised and perhaps even slightly indignant, the veteran warrior called for his war ponies to be gathered and brought to his lodge. He then painstakingly applied his war paint, covering his upper body in yellow pigment and drawing a singular lightning bolt down the left side of his face. He secured the lone feather he wore in his hair, as opposed to the flooring war bonnets favored by so many of his fellow warriors. As he readied himself, the younger warriors, those who had not heeded his warnings and danced into the wee hours of the morning, began to him and haw. They must attack now, they protested, before the fighting was over and there were no more trophies to be taken, nor honor to be won. But Crazy Horse remained unmoved. Finally, Crazy Horse's war mounts were brought to his lodge. After an excruciatingly long wait for the younger warriors, Crazy Horse emerged from his lodge. He selected a war horse, mounted it, and began to ride out of the village a large throng of warriors in tow. They headed first to a ridgeline where Major Reno was attempting to ensconce himself and his men, including his Crow Scouts, in a patch of timber in hopes of securing a workable defensive position. With the arrival of Crazy Horse and his contingent of warriors, the attack on Reno's element reached unbearable levels for his men. First, Reno's favorite Crow Scout was killed only feet away from him, leaving him covered in the scout's brains and blood. As the Lakota swirled around the cavalrymen, and arrows and bullets poured in from every direction, all hopes seemed lost. Unable to endure the terror any longer, a number of troops attempted to flee. Crazy Horse rode among the desperate troopers, methodically clubbing them down one by one. Some soldiers were so panicked they could not muster their legs to run, but only walk as they furiously pumped their arms. Some soldiers attempted to stop running, turn around, and beg their Lakota adversaries to show them mercy and to take them prisoner. All were promptly brained by war clubs or cut down in a hail of bullets and arrows. Reno and a number of his command would survive, but only due to Custer and his isolated contingent of men presenting a more enticing target and a more immediate threat. Custer had become desperate in the relentless onslaught that was being brought to bear by a native force the size of which he had never imagined. Now, with all hope fading, Custer was making a mad dash towards the heart of the main village in an attempt to sweep through it and apprehend as many women and children as possible, to hold as prisoners and hopefully to barter their peaceable retreat. 
This was not as crazy an idea as it may sound to modern ears, as this was a relatively common practice on the plains. However, Custer and his men would never make it to the village. Now, they were stuck fighting on a small hill, in a desperate roving retreat, and Crazy Horse was on his way. Upon arriving at the scene, Crazy Horse observed the field and consulted with his fellow warriors, all while coolly firing off his rifle and killing as many soldiers as possible from atop a small hill. Then, he and his men attacked the right flank of Custer's men, splitting what was left of the small remnant force into two even smaller elements. As the fighting continued, Crazy Horse rode between the two elements of soldiers, blowing his piercingly haunting eagle bone flute and shouting orders. Despite this nearly suicidal behavior, he remained untouched. By this time, the din of battle had shaken even the 7th Cavalry's war horses. Those that had not been cut down by enemy fire were simply let go as all the survivors left threw themselves down belly first into the grass in an attempt to minimize themselves as targets. This desperate situation lasted only briefly, however, until the air was pierced again by a loud war whistle. This was the signal for the Lakota to mount a massive general charge to finish off Custer and those under his command who remained alive, including Custer's two brothers and his teenage nephew. Thousands of warriors swarmed the hill. Custer and his men fired an initial volley that momentarily stalled the attack, but within seconds it had reconvened and swarmed in amongst the cavalrymen, cutting as many down as they could as some attempted to flee southward. All were summarily cut down within minutes. By the end of the day, every one of the 210 men under Custer's command would lie dead on that hill near the banks of the greasy grass. But, of course, today we know that river as the Little Bighorn, and the battle that took place there as one of the most seminal moments in American history. And, while it was, it was also a seminal moment in Northern Plains tribal history, as it ultimately marked the beginning of the end for their way of life. The U.S. Army, they knew, would be back and would seek vengeance for what had happened there. But for now, there was a great victory to celebrate. The next day, Crazy Horse would be named Commander-in-Chief of the Joint Forces comprised of the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho. His legend was solidified, but his prophecy only partially completed. A little over a year later, Crazy Horse would meet his martyr's fate, stabbed in the back by duplicitous soldiers in Fort Robinson, Nebraska. But that, like the plethora of other personal stories and accounts from the Battle of the Little Bighorn, is another story for another time. But what do you think? Was Crazy Horse fighting a doomed fight? Or was there a way for he and his people to ultimately win? What could Custer have done differently? What would you have done if put in either man's position? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you for joining us on this episode. Don't forget to click like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral. History too real for the Westerns.